Why would I not love you? I love you. What are you talking about? I tell you, I love okay, you. Okay, I'm time. saying if you don't love me, brother, if you don't love me, it means that you cannot you cannot say salam to me. That's what it said. If you love somebody, you say salam. No, that's right? not what it says. I'll read it again. Oh my gosh, dude. It literally just said Okay, can we read it again? Look, Let's read it again. It said, look, I got okay, you. Read it again. So look, it says, <clears throat> You have had you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven right all right so we're at the 10 minute mark so i'm gonna go ahead and swap this out let's go ahead and get ready to watch the movie ladies and gentlemen i heart yeshua you are not late we are about to start now we're at 83 viewers wanted to get it to 100 but hey it is what it is let's get it man 83 people here early let's go all right, you ready? Fourteen hundred years ago, armies of nomads swept out of the Arabian desert and conquered half the world. Today, their descendants tell an extraordinary story. They say that God sent them a prophet, Muhammad, and that God then gave them an empire. But is it really true? Not everyone is so sure. The Muslim conquests were one of the most decisive events in history. But were the Arabs in the seventh century even Muslims at all. My name's Tom Holland. I'm a historian, I write about ancient empires, so Persian, Greek, Roman empires. And now I want to write about the most influential of all the ancient empires, the empire founded by the Arabs in the seventh century the empire that gave us Islam. I thought that it would be a relatively simple matter. It's been said that Islam was born in the full light of history. But when I began on the project, I discovered that that wasn't actually the case at all. When it comes to Islam's beginnings, there is no full light of history, only a kind of darkness. And when you start looking, everything seems up for grabs. From the beginning, I felt like I was being sucked into a black hole. The problem of writing the history of the rise of Islam is that we have absence of evidence and we have nothing on which to tell a story. <laughs> I had expected Muslim testimony from the seventh century, but there's nothing there. I can't find anything. There's a problem here. You're delving into the origins of Muslims' deepest beliefs, but where is the historical evidence? Sometimes the belief of the believer and the understanding of the scholar cannot be squared. It's a choice between doing history and not doing history. And so I do the history even though it may hurt people. You have to say things that believers don't say things that sometimes shock believers, things that sometimes make them very angry. There's a sense of the detective story about it. Why do most of the clues seem to be missing? When the Romans conquered the Middle East, they left behind all kinds of evidence, histories, inscriptions, coins. 
But with the Muslim conquest, silence. What can we actually say about Muhammad? What do we really know about the origins of Islam? Where to begin? Well, maybe we should start at the beginning of the seventh century. It is five minutes to midnight and the ancient world is about to change forever. This is Istanbul. In 632, it was Constantinople. For 300 years, the capital city of the Roman Empire. A Christian city at the heart of a Christian world. A universal religion for a universal empire. That was the Roman recipe for power. An idea fully appreciated by the Muslims when, almost a thousand years later, they conquered the city and turned the largest cathedral in Christendom into a mosque. We know how and when the Romans became Christian because contemporaries tell us all about it. But what we don't know is how the Arabs became Muslim. Take a journey into the past and you can't be certain where it's going to end. History is like a labyrinth. Once you're inside, who knows where it may lead. So here we are, the great palace of the Roman emperors of Christian Constantinople. Odd to think that at the start of the seventh century when Muhammad was still alive, this was pretty much the center of the world. There's one awful poetry about the fact that all you've got here is splintered firewood. Um, because what, what this is, is is something that's been smashed to smithereens. And what, what it preserves just the faintest trace of is um, what was at the time the hub of the greatest power on the face of the earth. So this is the White House, it's where the emperor lives, it's the Pentagon, it's the heart of the defense establishment, it's the Supreme Court, it's where laws are drawn up and made and issued, all in this one place that dominates Constantinople, the city of Constantine, the first Christian empire, the greatest city in the world. And now it's all gone. And it's in some bloke's garden. You've got the road on one side, you've got the train on the other. And the only thing to be seen is a cat. By 6.30, the Roman Empire had just overcome the worst crisis in its history. Its old enemies, the Persians, had overrun its fairest provinces. Persian troops had reached the very walls of Constantinople itself. Then, after 25 years of war, the Persians were defeated. The Roman Emperor was, once again, master of the universe. At such a moment, how could he have had any conceivable idea of the ruin that the heavens had in store for him?
Professor, can someone like myself, who is not a Muslim and who does not believe that God spoke to Muhammad, ever hope to fathom the truth of the origins of Islam? No. العرب العرب نعم الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام كان عربيا Bedouin the face of the Arab conquest the shock troops who in the 7th century swept out of Arabia and forged a colossal empire spanning half the world and here in the desert no one doubts that the conquerors were indeed Muslim. Everything was for Islam. That's what they say today. The victories, the conquest, the empire. But how do we know Islam even existed back then? To the ancients, the Arabs were notorious savages of all the peoples of the earth, the most despised and insignificant. Yet after 10 years, in the first half of the seventh century, they deprived the Roman Empire of her richest provinces, crushed the Persian Empire, and taken possession of most of the Middle East. A staggering achievement. For most Muslims, a miracle. Only God could have made it happen. Bedouin Arabs. They're the margin of history during the Roman Empire. That through such a people, the whole of North Africa and Spain should be transformed in just a few decades, and a whole new civilization created within a century from China to France. And this is a historical fact. And it all began the story goes, when a merchant named Muhammad in a mountain cave heard something as terrifying as it was awesome, the voice of an angel. O oh, Muhammad, thou art the apostle of God. God had spoken to the Arabs. The message was as clear as it was elemental. There is only one God. Muhammad is the prophet of God. Islam is submission to God. And it was this message that gave them an empire. Or was it? No one doubts the conquests really took place. But the question is, was it because of Islam? If you were a Christian or a Jew or fall of another religion, for whom a similar reality exists, be easier to make a jump. There's a very famous Arabic proverb which says, not being able to know something is no proof that it doesn't exist. 
But making that jump, taking a leap of faith, isn't as easy as it sounds. In Western universities, historical research is all about skepticism and doubt. And just as earlier generations of scholars turned a penetrating spotlight on the life of Jesus, so now some are taking a radical new look at the life of Muhammad. Patricia Croner is a professor at Princeton. She is one of a number of historians whose research into the roots of Islam has sharply divided the world of early Islamic studies. You cannot reject the Muslim story, she wrote, but you cannot accept it either. The only solution is to step outside of the Islamic tradition and start again. There is a curtain as regards Muhammad that you can't get behind. What do we know about him and his life? Ah, well, we know that he existed. We know that he was active somewhere in Arabia. We know that he's associated with a book, the Quran. He was the one who uttered it. But uh, it doesn't get us to what actually happened, which is what, of course, a historian would like to reconstruct. We have absence of evidence. We have the Quran, and you can't tell the story of the basis of the Quran. We have various early non-Muslim sources. They don't add up to a story. We have nothing. We have this sort of this one book out of a nothing that's complete darkness. But here, that's not the way they see things. The Bedouin think they know everything about Muhammad. His character, his wives, even his favorite food. This is a whole world founded on stories of Muhammad. But the problem is, how do we know this was what it was like? How can we separate what really happened from the hearsay and the myths? Do we know, did the Prophet Muhammad come here or no? Yes, you are the Khan Kharaj min Makkah ila Manab Shan, Waja ala Mantaka, a jealous fee, Shajara fee, ala Safawi. Was the retreat? Was Muhammad even a traveling merchant? The evidence is almost non existent. The earliest biographies we have were written nearly 200 years after Muhammad's lifetime. In most religions, the tradition was handed down through oral history for millennia. This is put aside. That was called positive history. The oral tradition is completely negated. Well, oral tradition means that you remember what you want. Some of it must be history, and most of it is clearly not history. It's just that they have been reshaped, rethought, they have been taken out of their original context, serving new, 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 new functions. Uh, they've been cleaned up by all kinds, or cleaned up or messed up, if you like, by all kinds of, uh, you know, interests that people have in the memory. If supposing there is no written text of the time of the prophet mentioning his name, the same is true of Christ, the same is true of Moses, 
That doesn't mean anything because uh, there's always the oral tradition. Sometimes, if, if you have other sources from other points of view, you can suddenly see what it is that's been changed, and then if, when you can see that, you can also see why it has changed. But because uh, uh, Islam arose in a relatively remote corner of the world, we don't have these checks. We don't yet have the key that can unlock the tradition. I came here to get close to the tradition. And when you're here, you can feel its weight. It's in the air. It's palpable. It can't just be brushed aside. Millions upon millions of people believe it. This is their history. An entire moral universe has been built around the stories told of Muhammad. Listening to all these stories past me very moved. The other part of me was wondering, well, how do you know this? Where do these stories come from? Are they really true? Gradually in the West, for the intellectual elite, the sense of the sacred was lost. A tribal person in Africa or in the Amazon has a natural sense of the sacred, whereas a graduate student at Oxford probably doesn't. In some places, you have to be careful where you tread. Muslims believe that from the very beginning, the great Arab conquests were all about Islam. 
But in the seventh century, you can barely find a new religion called Islam anywhere in the historical record. And that's why I've come here. This is Jerusalem. They've been building walls here for a long time. But they've never built a wall yet that could keep people safe forever. Historically, the capital city of God has always been one of the world's most conquerable places. Here, if anywhere, in the one-time world of the Roman Empire, the 6th and 7th centuries live on. The same intensities, the same anxieties. For thousands of years, Jerusalem had been shaped and mapped by the religions of its rulers. When the Jews ruled, they built a gigantic temple which dominated the city. Later, when the Roman Empire became Christian, Jerusalem was transformed into the world center of Christian pilgrimage. Look at the street plan now, and you saw a map of a Christian world. The Jews were gone, airbrushed out of the picture. The Romans constructed a new holy of holies, the Holy Sepulchre, a vast cathedral raised over the traditionally accepted site of Jesus's crucifixion. That was how God and empire worked. The Roman Empire believed in God, and God believed in the Roman Empire. But then, in the year 636, God changed his mind. Arab marauders appear outside the walls. Sophronius, the city's bishop, writes that it is too dangerous to leave. The Arabs were closing in, and there was nothing people of Christian Jerusalem could do about it except to stay where they were, look out from their walls, and await the arrival of the Arabs. And out of the desert they came, and they had become irresistible. In 636, they beat a Roman army at Yarmouk. Soon after, they beat a Persian army at Cadesia. Both empires too weak after their own long wars to resist the Arabs. They marched into the richest provinces of the defeated empires. And less than five years after the death of Muhammad, they set their eyes upon the promised land. The land flowing with milk and honey, the land that God had promised to the Jews. Now, the Arabs had come to claim that birthright for themselves. The children of Israel had made it a Jewish land. The Romans had made it a Christian, holy land. If the Arabs did arrive with a new religion, then we should be able to find its imprint here. Contemporary Christian sources confirm that late in the 630s, the Arabs took over Jerusalem by peaceful negotiation. But what they don't say 
is what the conqueror's religion was. The truth of the matter is we don't know what was the true religion of the first Arab conquerors. We have a problem because this group of people from Arabia is tiny and they're ruling over much larger populations who are very well versed theologically uh, of Christians and Jews and Zoroastrians, but very sophisticated religious ideas. Why would these populations not have risen up in rebellion against their Muslim rulers uh, if these Muslim rulers are trying to impose something totally different that was hostile to their own beliefs? What were the Arabs up to? What were their motives? We know they called themselves believers, but believers in what? Certain Christian contemporaries tell us that the Arabs believed in a single God and that they followed a guide or instructor. But in general, their understanding of what the Arabs believed was deeply confused. Was it a form of Judaism or some kind of Christianity? Or did they have a whole new religion of their own? For the Jews, as well as for the Christians. These are people coming from the desert. They don't know who these people are. They don't really know what they believe. They hear things. But perhaps there was a clue. At first, the new Arab rulers seemed closer to the Jews. They weren't interested in the Christian holy places. Instead, they began praying on the ruins of the old Jewish temple. All this only added to the Christian sense of paranoia. Behind the invasion of the Arabs, they began to suspect a Jewish conspiracy. The moment the Arabs took over Jerusalem, they headed straight up here to what then as now is a broad, open, man-made esplanade. The holiest place to Jews anywhere in the world. So the fact that the Arab conquerors came up here and started building a prayer hall on such a sensitive spot inevitably served to raise quite a few eyebrows. The Jews hope that these Arabs from the desert come as liberators. They permitted the Jews to come back to the Temple Mount and pray there. And the Jews started believing uh, that maybe uh, there is something messianic in these people and maybe their leader is the Messiah who will permit them to rebuild the temple. Christian theologians who speak about the Arab conquerors find it very hard to understand that they are dealing with a new religion. Who are they? One thing is absolutely clear. Nobody had any notion that the Arabs were doing what they were doing in the name of a freshly minted and coherent new religion, still less that what they were doing was in the name of something called Islam. So did Islam even exist in those early years after Muhammad? In Jerusalem, 30 years after the conquest, it was business as usual. There were Christian pilgrims in the streets. The churches were full. Ancient religions were practicing their ancient rites. But where was the prophet in all this? 30 years after the death of Muhammad, here in Jerusalem, an Arab warlord called Muawiyah was hailed as leader of the new Arab empire. But if Muawiyah was a Muslim, then he showed precious little sign of it. The astonishing thing is that nowhere, not on his inscriptions, not on his coins, not on any of his documents, is there so much as a single mention of Muhammad.
I've been trying to trace the origins of Islam. But it's a bigger mystery than I'd ever imagined. This is the holy book of Islam, and it's the earliest source for Islam that we have. Find out where the Quran was composed, and you find out where Muhammad was operating, and then you get a picture of where Islam might have begun. In the Quran, it tells Muhammad to follow the path trod by Abraham. Maybe that's the place to start looking. I'm in Hebron, which is a town on the West Bank, and I'm currently in a Jewish settlement. Um, but Hebron is also very much a Palestinian city, and so the atmosphere is probably as tense as it is anywhere between Israelis and Palestinians. There are Israeli soldiers here with very large guns. Um, and what they're guarding is this, the burial place of Abraham. Abraham, through the line of his son Isaac, was the father of the Jews. When everyone else was still pagan, Abraham worshipped the one true God. And for this, God rewarded him and his descendants with the promised land, part of which today goes by the name of Israel. This is the tomb of Abraham. And the reason that the soldiers are here is that these are not the only people who regard him as their ancestor. And they're not the only people who believe that God gave them the promised land. On the other side of the grill are Muslims, and they tell a different story. This is the Muslim side, and the reason they revere Abraham is because, as well as Isaac, he had another son, Ishmael, the father of the Arabs. This is the tomb of Abraham that we saw earlier from the Jewish side, but we're now looking at it from the Muslim side significance of Abraham and this association that was made between Arabs and Ishmaelites, the children of Ishmael, is actually much older than Islam itself. It remains central to Islam to this day. According to Muslims, Abraham is their prophet and the religion he founded was not the religion of the Jews, but Islam. And in the Quran, we read that Ishmael helped Abraham to build a house of God at a place called Baca. Neither the Quran nor any contemporary source actually specifies where Baca was. But Muslims now would have absolutely no doubt that Baca is another name for a place deep in the Arabian deserts. Mecca. the holiest city in Islam, the birthplace of Muhammad. This is the largest mosque in the world. At its center, the Kaaba, the house of God, first built by Abraham and his son Ishmael, on foundations laid by the first man, Adam. It is older and holier than anywhere else in the world. It was in the hills above the city that Muhammad received the first of his revelations from God. These revelations would form the holy book of Islam, the Quran, the very word of God. Mecca is where Muslims believe everything began. crossroads of faith 
and history. Surely here then, you would think, we could find solid evidence for Islam's beginnings. But there is a problem. Aside from a single ambiguous mention in the Quran itself, there is no mention of Mecca, not one, in any datable text for over a hundred years after Muhammad's death. How can we know that, that Muhammad does come from Mecca? We can't. But on the other hand, if he doesn't come from there, you have to come up with an, a plausible alternative for where he might have come from. And why would you want to take that on? Why don't they get on? Well, you know, that's what historians do. If things don't fit, you try something else that might fit. Here we go. So this is it. Yeah, here we are. In the Quran, the faithful are instructed to pray in the direction of a holy sanctuary. But what it doesn't ever say is that this sanctuary stood at Mecca. And to some archaeologists, a few early mosques suggest something different. We're talking about one of the earliest examples we have of a mosque. And you date 100 years after Muhammad? Somewhere within 100 years or so. Because here, as we go into it, you can see. This is it. This is it, yeah. This is the mosque. This is the mosque. And what it's, you can. It's. What, <laughs> what you can see here, we have an apse which is not facing Mecca, it's not facing the south. It's actually facing towards the east, towards the sun rising. This is an example of the time before the direction had actually been preferred towards Mecca. So the implication of that is that, that at this early stage of Islam, the focus of prayer has not yet been absolutely fixed. The direction of prayer had not been well established yet. And so it's, it's a bit like the concrete hasn't yet said. It's yeah. there, you can still play with it, you can still fiddle around with it, you can experiment Very with it. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Not a decisive clue, perhaps. But it is suggestive that even though there are no Muslim sources, there are reports from Christian writers of the time that the Arab conquerors bowed their heads in prayer not in the direction of Mecca, but in a quite different direction, somewhere further north. In the Quran, it never actually states that Muhammad lived in Mecca, nor that Mecca was where the first revelations took place. Does the material in the Quran point to Mecca being the setting for God's revelations to Muhammad? No, it doesn't. I mean, there is mention of a sanctuary. There is a sanctuary, for sure. Over oh, where is that sanctuary? That's, of course, you, we can't tell. It's devilishly difficult to sort of extract what the context might have been from the text itself. In Muslim tradition, the people of Mecca are pagans, worshippers of idols. But in fact, the people the Quran describes have a deep and sophisticated knowledge of the biblical tradition. The Quran retells biblical stories and alludes to biblical stories, not just biblical, but also post-biblical developments. All this is clearly known to the audience. It suggests that what we have is a kind of response on the part of, let us say, Muhammad to the debates that were going on in Christian and Jewish communities, where they were debating theological issues and questions uh, that come out of the Hebrew Bible and come out of the New Testament. And the Quran seems to be an effort to engage in the discussion. And so there's a strong connection with the late antique religious discourses that were alive throughout the Near East. So it's obviously not a pagan world we're looking for. The people in the Quran worship a single God, 
but it then accuses them of praying to beings other than God. And there's something else. The people the prophet addresses in the Quran are farmers, agriculturalists, but there was no agriculture in Mecca. Mecca does not have an agrarian base. In Mecca, it seems to have been quite an arid valley. If Mecca is this barren, infertile place, how is it that in the Quran, the opponents of the prophet are described as keeping cattle and growing olives and vines? Hmm, good question. Um, this is one of the reasons why some scholars feel that the text of the Quran is really plugged into, say, Syria. Because that's where vines and olives yeah, grow you would find much further north. Geographical Syria, where you don't find <clears throat> olive trees in Mecca. So if Mecca wasn't the starting point of Islam, what was? If you're following the clues in the Quran itself, then you're looking for a landscape inhabited by olive growing Arabs who have a deep knowledge of the biblical tradition, but whose worship of a single God might seem to some a little shop soiled. This is the city of Avdat in the Negev desert. Back in the early seventh century, it was an Arab city on the very fringes of the Roman Empire, nominally Christian, but with hints of a recently pagan past. There can be no doubt that this is um, a Christian place of worship. There are two crosses on the ceiling, but there's also something very interesting in the corner, which is a bull complete with horns. And the bull is an image that very probably is drawn from much older native Arab pagan traditions. That doesn't mean that the Christians who built this were themselves pagan, but it does mean, I think, that they are giving their monotheism, their belief in a single God, a little bit of pagan color. And that essentially is the crime that Muhammad in the Quran seems to be accusing his opponents of. But Avdat had more than the right religious complexion. It also had agriculture and olives. In the lifetime of Muhammad, all this would have been green. It would have been agricultural fields as far as the eye can see. Archaeology leaves no doubt that there was a sophisticated irrigation system here that really did make the desert bloom. And so while that doesn't mean that this Avdat is the actual spot where the Quran was composed, it does imply, I think, that the region as a whole seems to fit the wider context of the Quran better than somewhere much further south in the arid region of Mecca. When you read through and through the Quran, what's really striking as compared, say, to the Bible, which is full of allusions to recognizable landscapes that we know. In the Quran, it's an effort to find an allusion to any landscape or natural setting that we could actually pin down. In fact, in the whole of the Quran, there's really only the one exception, not far from Avdat, a strange hint about where the Quran might actually have come from. We are on the southernmost shores of the Dead Sea, between what is now Israel and Jordan. Lot was the nephew of Abraham, and he went to settle down in a city called Sodom. And the people of Sodom were notoriously racy. Unsurprisingly, this provoked the wrath of God. He destroyed his city, and this is said to be the remains of Sodom, where the anger of God was poured down upon it. And the Quran. So also was Lot among those sent by us. Behold, we delivered him and his adherents, all except an old woman who was among those who lagged behind. 
then we destroyed the rest. Truly, you pass by their sights by day and by night. But if the people being addressed by the prophet are passing this place by day and by night, then what's it doing here? A thousand kilometers from Mecca. In terms of someone who is looking for clues, you are very much in the situation of someone who is panning for gold. And I think that this passage is just one little fleck. I mean, there is one possibility, of course, which is that this one fragment originated in this neighborhood. Perhaps the rest came from elsewhere. But that then begs the question of where all the various component parts of the Quran are coming from. Are they necessarily to be attributed to one person living at one time? Again, when you start asking that question, it's very hard to know how far to push it. It's from the West that this kind of history came up. That is, reason is the ultimate decider and judge of the truth. But what I'm saying is that those are not going to really give you the reason that is logically satisfying. Where, where do you think the likeliest place of its origin? Uh, well, that I don't know. <laughs> that I don't know. Uh, I don't think I should speculate on that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. My greatest fear is that I'm completely wrong. I do sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and think I've got it completely wrong. Once the world is reduced to a mechanical world, then all other levels of reality lose their status as being real. And they're relegated to the realm of so-called superstition. And what is not seen is considered not to exist. Trying to track the origins of Islam has been like chasing a mirage. The Arabs conquer half the world, but they don't talk about Muhammad. There's no mention of Mecca. So what do they do in detective stories? They follow the money. But any of these, what, what, what's, what's, what's the first coin that actually mentions the name of here of, of the Prophet Muhammad on the coins. Do any of these coins mention Muhammad by name? It was, it was uh, Muawiyah. Yeah, but is the, is the name of, is the, is the, name of the no, Prophet Muhammad no, mentioned? No, no, no. Every coin tells a story. Every inscription conveys an idea of power. Hey, hey, hey. But sometimes what's not on the coin can be just as significant as what is. It would, it would be nice to see the, the earliest coin that mentions Muhammad. The earliest uh, coin that has Muhammad's Has the name of Muhammad. They don't have it, but... Because it's, it's just, it's odd that we're 60 years on from the death of Muhammad and no mention of Muhammad. For nearly 60 years, the rulers of the Arab Empire didn't put Muhammad on their coins. And then they did. Maybe 
60 years was what they needed to work out what the story really was. Maybe the issue isn't why Mohammed was not on the coinage at the beginning, but how he got there in the end. What if I've been asking the wrong question? What if it wasn't Islam that gave birth to the Arab Empire, but the Arab Empire that gave birth to Islam? The empire was rich beyond imagining. By the mid 680s, it stretched from northern Persia to Egypt and North Africa. But who had the right to rule it? A vital question on which the Arabs could not agree. And with so much to play for, they began to turn upon themselves. It's 680. 50 years on from the death of Muhammad, a deadly spiral of rebellion and civil war is threatening the Arab empire with implosion. And from deep within the Arabian desert, a new claimant to the empire emerges. His name, Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr. And ibn al-Zubayr is going to change the game. What I've got here is the coin that I was looking for in the coin museum, and it's stamped quite literally with the genius of Ibn el Zabaya. It was struck in 685, 686, so that's more than half a century after the death of Muhammad. And it bears a novel and fateful slogan, in the name of God, Muhammad is the prophet of God. And so here, at last, emerging from out of the black hole, we get a mention of a Muhammad who is a prophet. And this is the first time we have it on any inscription, any surviving document. Ibn al zubayr had essentially realized what Constantine, the first Christian Roman emperor, had realized long before him, that it was no good the lord of an earthly empire laying claim to the favor of God unless he could absolutely demonstrate the cast iron basis on which he was making that claim. And Constantine, in his attempt to obtain that sanction, had turned to the Christian church. But Ibn al zubayr turns to the figure of Muhammad. Now, as it happens, Ibn al zubayr loses the civil war. He is defeated by a rival warlord who lays claim to the empire of the Arabs. But the discovery that the name of Muhammad can be used to buttress earthly power, that is not forgotten. The civil war had been a very close run thing. And the victorious warlord, Abdel Malik, had no intention of ever again allowing Muhammad's legacy to fall into the hands of a dangerous rival. The Romans had known all about religion and power. When they had become Christian, they had redrawn the map of Jerusalem. Now, Abdul Malik set about fashioning a holy city of his own. God is beautiful. <laughs> the dome of the rock. It's the oldest Islamic building in existence. In design, it was Roman. And Abdul Malik was doing something else that was Roman, plugging his dominion into the power of God. On the walls, there is an unequivocal mission statement. Religion, in the eyes of God, is Islam. There are mentions of Muhammad, quotations from the Quran. At last, something that we can recognize unmistakably as a new religion. There's a sense here of something new coming into being. There's the sense of the old, the Roman style pillars and, and the mosaics. And yet, this is clearly not Roman, this is clearly not Christian. This is the beginning of something very, very potent. 
harbinger of a spectacular future. It was built on the very site of the old Jewish temple. Down here, the foundation stone of the world, the very junction of heaven and earth. quite possibly one of the most awesome places on the entire planet. It is deeply, deeply holy, not to one, but to two great religions. It's the place where Jews believe uh, God inhabits on earth, the holy of holies, the Shekinah. And to Muslims, it is the cave that Muhammad prayed in after being brought here from Mecca, before he ascended to heaven, to be confirmed as the seal of the prophets. So, in religious terms, this is like a sort of nuclear reactor firing out isotopes and power. It's certainly a very grand statement that we Muslims have superseded you Jews. And we have superseded you Christians by being filled with inscriptions uh, directed against Christian Trinitarian beliefs. So it's, it's Muslims saying, uh, we are here, we've come to stay, and we are the winners. Abdul Malik now rules his empire as the deputy of God, just as the Christian Roman emperors had done. And like the Roman emperors, he has built a house of God in Jerusalem. But Abdul Malik, Lord of Jerusalem though he is, is also an Arab. Perhaps for Arabs, Jerusalem, for all its ancient and unrivaled potency, owed too much to the Jews and Christians to stand alone as the holy city of the new Arab empire. A poet at Abdul Malik's court describes him as the Lord of two houses sacred to God, one in Jerusalem and one well, he doesn't say where it is. And for 100 years after the death of Muhammad, no one says where it is. All sources go on calling it a place in the desert. It's a sanctuary in the desert without giving it a name. And at some point, this sanctuary must have been fixed at Mecca, in the middle of the desert. But why? The truth of the matter is we don't know what was the true religion of the first Arab conquerors. It's an Arab story. Arabs come from the desert. God is speaking to the Arabs. They don't want Jews or Christians having any influence on Muhammad. Hello. The Quran is in Arabic. The Quran is full of characters from the Bible. But if the book came out of the desert, how did these characters get there? We have nothing. We have this one book out of a nothing. We don't have the key that can unlock the tradition. But maybe that's the point. We're not supposed to unlock the tradition. God's message comes to a prophet. The prophet lives in a desert. There is no room for anyone else. It's remote. It's remote. It's uncontaminated. It's pure. It's a place where we can rule out that Muhammad got his ideas from others than God. It's interesting that this rationalistic history is very weak in being able to provide causes for certain effects. Not being able to know something is no proof that it doesn't exist. 
You begin by looking in the record and all you find is emptiness. And you end up in the desert and all you see is emptiness. But perhaps the emptiness is the answer. Maybe Mecca gave Islam what it most needed, a blank sheet where Muslims could put their prophet beyond the reach of history. Professor, do you think that what I am doing is complicit with the brute fact of Western imperialism, Western hegemony? No, not necessarily. As long as you remain aware of what you're doing. If you come as a Western scholar or historian, and in all honesty, present what your worldview is, and let's say when I look at, at the Islamic world, from this paradigm, this is what I see. And bring out why this is different from what, how Muslims see themselves. That, I think, is a very honest effort. And it's a good effort. But if you try to act as a doctor to a child, take this medicine, it's good for you. You don't know what you're eating the wrong thing. Uh, this is how it should be. That's where the problem begins. And uh, the Muslim world is not going to accept that. The days when the British would bring scholars from England to teach Indians how to uh, be Hindus and Muslims is finished. It's finished. It's true. Before I began, I did have preconceptions. I was brought up a Christian, but I was also brought up in an environment that questions everything. Studying ancient history is a process of paint stripping, tearing away stories that you want to believe the literal truth of. This is supposed to be Mount Sinai, where Moses saw the burning bush, where God gave him the Ten Commandments. But there's no historical evidence for any of this. Christian monastery, Roman fortifications, the old partnership, God and empire. Between them, they turned this place into Sinai. In my heart, I want to believe it, but my head won't let me. We believe that there was a living tradition kept by the people here, that this is where God had revealed himself in an extraordinary way. How much would it matter if it turned out that this wasn't? the place where Moses had received the Ten Commandments. But the spiritual encounter with God is more important. The reality is there, even if your eyes aren't open to see things in actuality. God is always present, but you're not aware of his presence. Ultimately, the city of God matters more than the city of man. Yes. But as a historian, I have to presume that the city of God was built by man as well. I wanted to map the human past in human terms, to make a map that fits the facts. But I traveled to places where the maps revealed a heavenly plan, sacred lands, sacred places. A world where you don't have to believe in God to feel the power of God. This is the promised land. Some call it Israel, some call it Palestine. A land where Muslims Christians 
and Jews still fight over the story of a promise made by God to Abraham thousands of years ago. Was there really a promise? It's not for the historian to say. But the world believers make in the name of God, that is what history is about. Even today, more people die for visions of heaven than they ever do for historical facts. Stories that never happened can be infinitely more powerful than stories that did. I set out to write the story of the beginnings of Islam. If you're a Muslim, then there's no problem. Everything is explained by God. But I'm not a Muslim. And I don't think that civilizations appear like lightning from a clear blue sky. What I think now is that Islam emerged from a whole range of circumstances. From the religions and the empires and the convulsions of the world that witnessed its birth. And yes, of course, it is still the case. The black hole that surrounds Islam's beginnings doesn't give up its secrets easily. But maybe we are getting somewhere. The search for the historical Muhammad, for the origins of the Quran, for the whereabouts of the first century, for the way Islam evolved out of the Arab empire. These are pieces of a whole new story. Tomorrow night, the wait is over. The Paralympic Games opening ceremony kicks off at eight. It's shrouded in secrecy, but I can tell you in all probability. All right, all right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, that was the movie there. So the name of the flick will be in the description. For those of you who want to rewatch it, you can either rewatch it here. I did not interrupt at all, or you can go find it yourselves uh on youtube so it's called islam the untold story and for those of you who don't know after this this man definitely did get uh attacked by muslims uh regardless of what that man said he obviously doesn't know his religion um well enough to not warn him that realistically no matter what you say if it's damaging to our religion you will have some hecklers and attackers um so you know he tried to sugarcoat it a little bit um i don't think what this man did was 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 wrong in any way he just dove directly into the history and this is what he came out with you know so those of us who have been digging into islam and looking into you know, the history and so on and so forth. I think it would have been very easy to understand what this man was actually finding, talking about, and bringing up. This is very damaging if the things that he brought up right here is accurately 100% true. All of it doesn't even have to be true. Some of it can just be true. This is very damaging. So, I want to leave you guys with this. Don't want to talk too much. I want to make sure you guys, um, you know, uh, uh, ponder on what you just watched. And with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and close out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, peace. Thank you for watching.